on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I don't find much evidence that meat is harmful to humans. and it's, it's part of our evolutionary history. It seems like one of the most neutrally digested things that you can eat. We've really come to think of food as protein, fat, and carbohydrates, which is the tip of the iceberg. We've really forgotten about micronutrients. I don't think people ever really talk about or think about meat as containing antioxidants. That's a really interesting perspective. You know, I think berries and fruits and colors. And then what about organs? Because people just think of liver. People have idea that liver is just a filter. Your liver is a factory. It's not an organ of elimination, and it's not a filter at all. Your liver does alchemy all day long. There are no billionaire regenerative farmers. But you bet there are billionaire and multimillionaire people who invest and build processed food companies. Episode 94 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Why Meat is Good for You, with Paul Saladino, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. If you're looking to increase testosterone levels without turning to pharmaceutical testosterone replacement therapy, you need to take a look at Sir Thrival's Pine Pollen. Pine pollen is a rich source of naturally occurring testosterone and a suite of other androgenic hormones that can be used to gently boost your T levels. Right now, until the end of August, the coupon code RESTORE20 gets you 20% off all pine pollen products at surthrival.com. My favorite is Sir Thrival's Pine Pollen Pure Potency, an herbal elixir formulated with stinging nettle root to keep your body's free testosterone levels up, while the pine pollen gently boosts them. It's got Siberian ginseng for hormone upregulation and maple syrup, vanilla bean, and orange peel to give it an incredible flavor. Stop by SirThrival.com to check out the entire pine pollen lineup, including pine pollen powder, pine pollen tincture, and of course, pine pollen pure potency, Sir Thrival's flagship pine pollen product and for the rest of august use the coupon code restore 20 for 20 percent off all pine pollen products at surthrival.com if you're drawn to hunting as a rite of passage then check out sacredhunting.com there's so many new or potential hunters who want to develop ancestral skills and intimate relationships with wild animals in the landscape but who aren't drawn to the commercialization of so much of modern hunting culture sacredhunting.com and its founder monsel denton are different sacred hunting provides a space for new hunters to learn to stalk harvest and field dress animals in conjunction with indigenous ceremonies that introduce you to hunting in a more intentional and spiritually connected way Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts, and more advanced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe, like Axis deer hunts on Molokai in Hawaii, and even a northern Siberia hunt with the Nenets people coming up in 2022. There's only a few spots available on each hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available when you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fed podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and learn more about Monsel and Sacred Hunting on episode 59 of the Wild Fed podcast. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to the Wild Fed podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild fed. Food is all around you. Today I'm talking with Paul Saladino, the carnivore MD, one of the most vocal proponents of the very in vogue carnivore diet. Now, if you listen to this show, it's no mystery I'm as much a plant person as I am a hunter. I hunt, yes, but I also gather. I believe in both and the long tradition of human omnivory, so you won't hear me giving up plants anytime soon. My days of radical dietary experimentation are behind me, so while you'll no doubt catch me eating strange foods, you probably won't find me restricting whole kingdoms of life from my diet. But I appreciate Paul and his perspective and the work he's done to combat the anti-meat sentiment, you could almost say propaganda, that's become so commonplace in the last decade or so. For part of this conversation, we talk about meat and why it's so much more than just protein. There are key micronutrients found in meat and organs that simply aren't found in plant foods, and those things need to be recognized. It's tiresome to hear meat treated like some kind of bad actor when it's been the most sought-after food for humans for our entire history. And we know that's true from archaeology, anthropology, and from what can still be witnessed today from both modern hunter-gatherer diets and by reading the menus of restaurants all over the developed world. The second part of this interview, we discuss Paul's time with the Hadza in Tanzania and what he learned about their dietary preferences. 
I find this part very intriguing as they represent some of the last contemporary peoples with a living tradition of hunting and gathering for subsistence. A couple quick notes. Paul and I tread, albeit lightly, into some terrain I usually prefer to stay away from publicly, like the politics of censorship and medical freedom. While I have opinions, strong and fairly educated ones, on the current zeitgeist and the divisiveness of our era, I prefer to stay out of the fray. It's not that I'm ignorant of the times, it's just that these kinds of discussions are not the purpose or direction of this show, and you can find plenty of opinions you agree with or disagree with freely available everywhere on the internet. You certainly don't need more of that from me. But we went there a bit, and I decided for the sake of honesty not to edit it out. Secondly, Paul was in Costa Rica for this call, and he had some construction taking place around his home. So please forgive me if there are some background noises during parts of the episode. We do our best to deliver high-quality audio to you each week, but occasionally things like that happen. Overall, this is a really useful discussion, especially in a time when our fundamental, biologically appropriate foods are under constant attack by a well-intentioned and sometimes not so well-intentioned media and medical institution. Paul's a radical. He's a rebel. He's a pioneer, and he's fearlessly sharing a message that deserves to be heard. I don't agree with all of his conclusions, but I certainly appreciate what he has to say, and I hope you do too. Paul Saladino, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, brother. It's good to be here. Man, I'm excited to talk to you today. Man. I've been thinking about, I've been looking over your Instagram quite a bit, and uh, there's just a lot of juicy stuff there I kind of want to tear into. But uh, I know you as sort of the carnivore diet guy. I think that's how people know you. Um, you're on Instagram as at carnivoremd. Uh, but I'd love to hear a little more about you so that I get a better sense of who you are as a person. Yeah, man. I, uh, I'm a physician, I'm traditionally trained, I'm an MD. Uh, I grew up in a medical family. My dad's a doctor, but I had a non-traditional path. After college, I took like six years off and spent a lot of time in the wilderness. I threw hiked the Pacific Crest Trail uh, from Mexico to Canada in the year 2000. I fell in love with skiing and then backcountry skiing and then spent basically six years after college in the wilderness or in wild places, which is something that I'm sure you will appreciate. Um, the wilderness of the Pacific Crest Trail, the wilderness of like high mountain landscapes and the wilderness of lakes and rivers and all those places. And then eventually I remember one day I was working in a bike shop and I thought, you know, I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life. What do I want to do? My dad's a doctor. He spent the majority of his life in some ways in indentured servitude to the medical profession. And I thought, I don't want to be a doctor. That How do you mean like that? How life. do you mean indentured servitude? What do you mean? Uh, basically, student loans or yeah, student loans. So medicine is a strange beast. If you're not a physician or you're not in medicine, uh, it's difficult to understand it. But when my father, when I saw my father as a physician in the 1980s and 1990s, this was the transition from him being in private practice as a solo physician, then in conjunction with one other physician, and then into managed care. So this is a whole realm of like managed care was happening in the 1980s and 1990s. It's not a terribly interesting thing to talk about for people who are not interested in like healthcare policy, but it changed the way my dad had to practice medicine in a big way. He was really forced to join HMOs, people, you know, like a, a managed care organization. So he suddenly has a boss who is going to tell him when he's working and how much he's working and 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 manage the way that he's giving care to patients and tell him how many patients are on his schedule. And so that was the first piece of it. The second piece of it was that in medicine in the 1980s and 1990s, internists, my dad is an internal medicine physician, internists worked in the, their clinics during the day and then went to the hospital after they finished to make rounds on their patients who were hospitalized. Mm. So I remember growing up, it was not uncommon for my father to not be at the dinner table for him to come home after I was asleep and for me to not see much of him at all. Uh, because he was seeing patients in the clinic, and then he was going to the hospital after work to make rounds on his patients who were hospitalized. And then he would come home with literally a mountain of charts that were paper charts at the time and stay up until two or three in the morning, like charting <laughs> on his patients. And so to me, that looked like indentured servitude. I thought medicine is great and noble, and my dad is a martyr. And I never see him, and his health suffered in major, major ways because of that, you know, he became obese. He smoked until I was eight or nine years old. You know, no way. <laughs> yeah, this was common in Western medicine. Um, he was depressed, I found out later. And, you know, for 
you know, on, on medications for that for some amount of time. A lot of this was hidden from me as a child. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to do, moving on from my sort of vagabonding adventuring, I thought, well, I don't want to be a doctor. And so I went to PA school. At first, I went to become a physician assistant. And I did that at George Washington University in D.C. and then worked in cardiology for four years. And that was my first kind of exposure to Western medicine. But very quickly, once I had gotten out of PA school, I realized that it didn't compute with me. It wasn't compatible with my view of the world. And, and very quickly, I found it to be just uncomfortable to practice medicine in a system that operated under a paradigm that I didn't espouse. And the paradigm that Western medicine operates under is it's symptom focused and pharmaceutical based. There's really no discussion of what is the root cause of a patient's illness or a person's illness, an individual's illness. It's just, you are patted on the back. You are congratulated if you are able to name the illness. And once you are able to name the illness, we inevitably have a medicine for you handed down from the pharmaceutical gods. Um, of course, I'm speaking in a little bit of uh, hyperbole here, but this is the way it seemed to me. Like there was not discussion in PA school about what is causing this illness, whether it's depression, anxiety, whether it's eczema, whether it's asthma, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart disease. It was just, we know how to treat this. Trust your physician. Trust we know how us. To treat, we know how to treat these symptoms. It's interesting how allopathy has become the dominant medical force in the world. There were so many competing paradigms and somehow this organization through politics, you know, the, the AMA, has like taken over and hijacked all of modern medicine, right? It's very strange. It's completely strange, man. It's, it's so, it's so weird. And yeah, it, it, it's, but we accept it as the norm and we don't know any different. And when you're, you know, when you're a physician and you're in your practice, you sort of, you just do this. You learn for tests, for your board exams, you learn how to treat disease. You don't learn what causes it. Nobody thinks about food and nutrition and the immune system in relation to these things. Those concepts are never discussed. Even there are hints of it, right? We can say, oh, there's celiac disease, which is, of course, this regression of the small intestinal villi, and in, in, it's an autoimmune reaction to gluten. But that's never even really thought of as a model for other diseases. And I think that's exactly what it is. I mean, that's the prototypic disease of an autoimmune illness in response to a food antigen. Yeah. But that's never something that we are challenged to think about as physicians. So working as a physician assistant, I quickly realized, like, I don't, I don't like this. Um, I don't, I don't want to keep doing this. I think that the, the only way for me to, to change this is to, is to go back to medical school, to become a doctor, and then <laughs> to build in. a practice. Yeah, go deeper in, to build a practice that is based on the root cause of an illness, to be a physician, to be someone who treats illness, because that's always fascinating to me as a human, but I want to do it from a root cause perspective. And, and there are lots of people who do this today, thankfully. It goes by many different names, none of which are perfect. You could call this holistic medicine. You could call this integrative medicine. You could call this functional medicine. I think they all have their, their shortcomings and their benefits, but I just knew that I wanted to do root cause medicine. I wanted to ask questions and understand this. And so I went back to medical school at the University of Arizona, um, which is sort of known for being a hub of integrative quote medicine. I found out I didn't really like the flavor of integrative medicine they they taught there, but nevertheless, I, I, I tried. And then after, uh, after that, I went to residency at the University of Washington, all the while kind of feeling like a double agent. I was like, I am, yeah. <clears throat> I am an operative. I don't, <laughs> I don't trust what you're telling me. And, and I know there's more to this story. I'm going to learn what you're telling me and I'm going to learn how to do the knee jerk reaction. And I'm going to, do well on my boards and I'm going to learn what medications you want me to use for these things. But I'm also going to see what I can figure out from seeing patients and treating them about what might be causing these illnesses. And so that was the beginning of my, all throughout it, I was sort of boiling under the surface or at least simmering and thinking, what is going on here? And, and throughout all of it, I had my own medical issues, which were kind of keeping me interested in this way of thinking, specifically eczema and asthma, but mostly eczema, which is for people who are not familiar, it's just a skin condition that causes itchy bumps, usually on the elbows and the wrists. Mine happened on my lower back and all sorts of places. In medical school, I did a lot of jujitsu 
And it was at times debilitating because I would get impetigo, which is a skin surface super infection of these open um, sort of uh, these open uh, like little little red bumps on my skin. And so this isn't good. And at times I had to take antibiotics and it was very frustrating. And at times the eczema got very bad and covered a lot of my body. And I thought, okay, I can go to the dermatologist, but I know what the dermatologist is going to say. Here's a pill for you. Here's a steroid. Here's a cream. And I thought, that's not what I want. I want to know what's causing eczema. But if you ask people in medicine this, the response is usually the same, which is we don't know you have quote, bad genetics. And I think that's just not a suspicious, that's just not a satisfying <laughs> answer for me. That's never yeah. been like, that's that, but that is parroted. No matter what condition you or people you care about suffer from, that's the answer you will hear, which is whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's heart attack, whether it's hypothyroidism, whether it's cancer, whether it's another autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or whatever, we don't know what causes it. That, you know, the subtext is we don't care what causes it. We're not even looking to see what causes it. There's no ongoing research. We're not in it. that business. Right. <laughs> We're not in that right. business. Right. We don't know what causes it, but you have bad genetics. And it's, that's partially true, to be fair. Like, you don't have bad genetics, but I think all of us, every single human, has a predisposition at a genetic level to something. We all have, quote, chinks in the armor. We all have an Achilles heel for something. Mm -hmm. And so when our bodies get imbalanced- Often caused caused by an adaptation of something else, right? Like sometimes it's because our body's really good at one thing and that there's a detriment on the back end of that that makes us susceptible to something else. It could be, right? But I think that we all manifest, quote, inflammation differently. We all manifest imbalances differently when- When I get a little inflamed, my eczema comes back or I get a little wheezing or, you know, my alveoli contract, my bronchioles contract, right? This is what happens. And some people have predispositions toward atherosclerosis, heart disease. Some people have predispositions toward another autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis. So we all manifest inflammation imbalance stemming from somewhere. That's the important question differently. But Western medicine gets tied in knots over this, tied in knots. And they think, there are 74,000 different diseases. And I looked at this going, <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. There's yeah. maybe 10, right? And that's obviously yeah. no simplification, but there's like, okay, you're either eating the wrong foods, you have nutrient deficiencies, your sleep sucks, you're super stressed, or you're exposed to toxins or mold. Like that, I, just those, those six things, those five things, I think will cover 85, 90% of chronic illness. Yeah. That and But none of those are addressed in Western medicine. So that was kind of the genesis. And That was the beginning of my jumping off point for dietary experiments. I'd been thinking about my diet for years and years and years, but it it didn't, it didn't really click for me until I, I took some, some, what people might consider to be drastic or extreme sort of steps in my own diet. Radical health decisions. I want to talk about that in a second, (laughs) but I want to say first, uh, it's funny how I think it's changing now, but the boomer generation in particular and their parents, they have this attitude towards doctors, like as if they, you know, they're sent from, from the gods, you know, they can do no wrong. Uh, they just believe whatever they're told, uh, by doctors and sometimes quite doctors who are quite young. And I always think it's really strange because, you know, I would, I don't, I don't trust anybody in any profession who's right out of school. Like you haven't had time to learn anything. You know, I would think like you need 20, 30 years of seeing patients before you even really understand the patterns that you're seeing, you know, um, also, I think while people are at medical school, they're, they're working so hard and they're so busy. It's not like they have time to be questioning the paradigm, you know, at any level. So I find all of that really, <laughs> just really amusing. And then, you know, getting out of there, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, most of the physicians I've met, by the time they're out of school, not only are they saddled with quite a bit of debt, but uh, there's quite a bit of ladder climbing stuff going on, right? So like jockeying for social position for a lot of physicians, like the house, the car, the family, all those kind of things. Um, what's your social status as a doctor? They seems like that can eat up a lot of somebody's mental space. Um, that doesn't leave a lot of room for questioning how the paradigm works. Absolutely. It, and you're completely right. In medical school, you are in a pressure cooker. And this is not this is not to say that physicians are not generally intelligent, well-intentioned. Uh, super caring. intelligent. Super intelligent. Yeah. Had nothing to do with that. It's, it's, it's <laughs> very yeah, intelligent. Yeah. It's, it's the, the system does not challenge us or give us space to think outside the box. Yeah. And that's a, that's a sort of cliche term, but it's true in this case. And, and, and you're absolutely right. You come out of medical school, you go to residency, so you bust your ass in medical school, you do as well as you can on your board exams to get into the best residency you can. Then you go to your residency 
and you work like a dog. Yeah. <laughs> you work like a dog for four or five or six years. And then you come out of residency and you, you do, you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and you, you have to work like, okay. And, and finally, after eight, nine, 10 years of graduate education and medical school and residency, you are now at the bottom of the totem pole as a, as a junior physician. Yeah. And, and yes, your senior physicians who have been there for 20 years have paid their dues and, and they're still going to be looking at the way you're doing things. And it's like, you, you, it sometimes feels like you're running on a treadmill and you just never have time to look around you and say, what am I doing here? And so I was very lucky to, to just step off that very, very soon. Uh, really, even in my residency, I stepped off uh, the treadmill and, and to not have to run that sort of rat race. But that, that allowed me to, to do my best to start thinking differently and like looking at things and trying to connect the dots in, in order to offer people something of value. Um, not to say that physicians are not doing things of value, just I wanted to offer something differently and I wanted to connect the dots differently. Well, it's interesting with modern medicine too, because they, uh, it's sort of, the sciences are often like this. They have a difficult time acknowledging the past mistakes and that the things they think now could also be wrong in the way that they were dramatically wrong in the past. So, you know, like lobotomy is a really good example, <laughs> you know, when they were, they were putting a spike in people's eyes and uh, destroying part of their brain. Uh, and this was thought to be, you know, for psychosis. And they even, you know, the guy who developed it went around the country in the lobotomobile performing lobotomies all over the country, right? I think he even got the Nobel Prize for that. But, uh, you know, now obviously we look at that and that's horrific or, you know, leeches or thalidomide, right? <laughs> like causing, causing the flipper babies as they were called. And, you know, but today we're like, we're told, no, it's safe. And it's like, well, <laughs> how do we know? Like you guys have made a lot of mistakes in the past. Uh, and it, it seems very, really difficult sometimes for the AMA to, um, I don't know why there's not like a more, there's so much hubris and like, it seems like there could be a little more humility given some of the horrific mistakes that have been made. They seem so sure about everything that they, they talk about today, you know? So that always like really makes me skeptical, I guess, of modern medicine. And we're seeing some stuff today that's like, you know, they keep changing position like week by week right now. You know, it's like a little hard to take it seriously. It's so interesting, Daniel. There's an, an adage in medical school that is told to you by your physician, physician supervisors that 50 percent of what you learn in medical school will be wrong. Mm, wow. But then, really? but then when you get out of medical school or residency and you question things, you are vehemently opposed and called yeah. a heretic and accused of apostasy. And, uh, you know, it's like, what? Like, right. yeah, it's, it's crazy to think that there is an awareness that what we do in medicine is not right. And then when you try to question it, you are called a pseudoscientist. You know, it's like, well, we don't have evidence to... It's like, okay, I'm using my brain and trying to connect the dots and asking questions. And that's sort of the nature of our social media today is we're not even allowed to ask questions, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Like they say, I don't know if it's a true story, but they say like they, you know, with Galileo, like he couldn't even get the priesthood to look through his telescope. They didn't even want to look, you know, it's like, it's pretty amazing, right? They're like more interested in putting him to death for, you know, upsetting their apple cart. But so you started to strike off on your own and experiment with food. Is that primarily kind of the direction that you went from there? Yeah, I throughout all of this, I had had strong suspicion that food was the major trigger for autoimmunity for many people. Or, you know, I would I would actually I would say that's a true statement that I I believe that it is the major trigger, not the only trigger, but a significant trigger. We put in kilogram quantities of food into our gut every day. And, and why do we not understand that that is molecular information mm -hmm. that is going to our immune system? This, sure. this really precise and powerful immune system that lives just on the other side of the single layer of epithelium in our gut. Mm, yeah. And there's a yeah. huge amount of diplomacy that has to happen within our body, within our small and large intestine. And we are literally putting in kilogram quantities of information that the diplomats and that everyone has to negotiate with every single day. And so I thought, I think my hypothesis, which is not original to me, many people have hypothesized the same thing, 
we've just arrived at different conclusions. But my hypothesis was, I believe that my eczema and perhaps many people's autoimmunity, which can take many forms, is driven by incompatibilities between food and the terrain of our body. And so I began to experiment. And like I said, I wasn't eating junk food. I was eating an organic paleo diet consisting of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, um, grass-fed meat. I didn't eat a lot of organs at that time, but fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and not a whole lot else. And I still had eczema that was pretty darn severe. So I thought, okay, there are still things in my diet that must be removed. And I'd already done the vegan experiment. Um, we talked about this on, on my podcast um, when, when you shared your experiences with your vegan diet. I knew that it wasn't meat. And I don't really find much evidence that meat is harmful to humans. And it's, it's part of our evolutionary history. I don't think meat is a large antigen causing autoimmunity for most people. Um, it seems so I, like one of the most neutrally digested things yeah. that you can eat. I completely agree with that. And, and many people, when they hear me say that, say, well, what about all this factory farm meat? And I say, yeah, nobody's arguing for factory farming or the use of antibiotics or the use of hormones in your meat. But in 2021, that, that point is almost moot because there is so much availability, whether you do like yeah. you do Daniel and you go hunt your own meat or you order your meat online from one of many and growing number of regenerative farms, grass fed, grass finished operations. Like there's lots of opportunity for people to vote with their dollars and support uh, meat that is raised humanely in an ecologically sustainable manner that actually in, encourages the formation and supports the formation of ecosystems on the land. So that's the regenerative agriculture movement, which we can get into in the future. But I knew it wasn't meat. Or I didn't. I didn't think it was meat that was causing my eczema. So I had to look at the rest of my foods and going and and think. All right, it could be nuts or seeds or fruit or vegetables. Um, I heard about this thing called the carnivore diet. It sounds really crazy, but I'm going to do it because I like to do things like that. I'm going to go exploring. And I like the simplicity of it. What if I just cut out all the plants? And what if I just do that? And that was what I did. Uh, lo and behold, things got a lot better. Within two to three weeks, the eczema was completely gone. And then I had a bunch of other sort of psychological benefits, which I didn't expect. I just sort of saw the world differently. And my perspective on the world change. This is a subjective experience, but my experience was that I just felt better. I felt more emotionally stable when I did that. And this is not to say that, that the carnivore diet experiment didn't have speed bumps and that I didn't eventually sort of modify it. But I, for a year and a half, I ate nothing but meat and fat and organs, and I felt pretty darn good. Um, I think there are some issues that many humans run into with long-term ketosis as a result of that. And we can talk about that, um, that eventually led to me reincorporating um, some of what I consider to be the least toxic plant foods like fruit and honey into my diet. But that's where I stand now. But it, it all is just to say that my own personal experimentation led me to kind of expand and build upon the work of many others in the paleo space and the autoimmune paleo space. This idea that, that food triggers autoimmunity is, is not new. It's, it's a question that's been asked or a hypothesis that's been proffered for decades now. It's just that I sort of saw it differently and thought, is it the plant leaves and stems and seeds that could be doing this? And why would it be doing that? And so when I experienced benefits in my own life, I sort of went down the rabbit hole, did research, wrote a book and, and sort of built on that for people. You know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, and um, I think we're kind of getting there now, you know, and people can go back and listen. Uh, thank you for having me on your show, by the way. And and uh, your audience is awesome. I mean, so many people, you know, jumped on my Instagram after, started following our podcast. So I want to say thank you for that and that opportunity. Um, you and I talk a little bit, sort of, I talk about being an omnivore. You talk about the carnivore thing, talk about what plants you eat. And so I, people can go back and check that out. And, uh, you know, you and I, I think you and I see a lot of things the same, see some things different, but I, I don't think we need to debate that. We're definitely on the same team. Um, what I want to ask you about in particular is you have this post up on your Instagram that really struck me. Um, and it's a picture of a piece of beef in someone's hand. And it says, it's, got, it's actually that picture, the same picture side by side. And the one side says what people think meat is or beef is. And it says uh, like protein, some fat. And then it's like what meat actually contains. And I think we've reached this point in history where people have been so inculcated in this idea of plant-based diets and this forks over knives approach. And that it's interesting where a lot of that's being driven from. 
Um, so, you know, that's something we could get into as well. But I, I think that a lot of people, you know, we've got a lot of listeners here who have been vegans or vegetarians in the past who listen to this show because they're into foraging and they're into herbalism and they're into plants. And, and um, I think sometimes it's easy to forget you know, a lot of people will say, hey, I want to eat animal food, so I'm interested in hunting because I want to do it myself and I want to do it ethically. So that's one of the things that comes up here a lot. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about why meat is good for us. And I kind of get a little frustrated with that sometimes because, you know, I'm thinking back to my days as a vegan. I would go to a lot of these like workshops and events and stuff and retreats. And um, I remember being at this one and uh, there was a, a vegan woman, a very prominent speaker in that world, talking about how important B vitamins were. And then somebody says to her in the audience, well, what are some foods that contain B vitamins? And she was like, oh, well, they're in lots of things. And she, she wouldn't give anything specific. And, and my buddy looks at me, leans over, he goes, meat. <laughs> you know, it's like it's in meat, dude. You don't you're trying to like recreate and piece together some of the things that are in animal foods with plants. And it seems like such a stretch. So. Could you talk to us a little bit about why meat's beneficial outside of what most people go like protein, you know, vitamin A? Like there, I know that there's these things we know, but what are people not thinking about? Because it's so easy for people to dismiss it because there's so much cultural support for saying, oh, meat's bad for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're so right here. And I think that there is this, there's this misconception within the popular culture about macronutrients and macros and and there's an over emphasis on macros so yeah. what are your macros and so we've we've really come to think of food as protein fat and carbohydrates which is the tip of the iceberg and, and i always, I always throw alcohol in there because it's a macro that people forget about it's seven exactly. calories per gram i love throwing it in because really when you break down american diets you're like oh that's a pretty big slice of your pie there Yes, it is. Yes, alcohol is another macronutrient. But we've really forgotten about micronutrients. Yeah. And, and what are micronutrients? Well, micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. And then there's other micronutrients that we, we don't even really hear about, things like peptides. And we can talk about that too. But when you look at meat, and I, I just have to give a shout out to my buddy Ryan Carter, who's that's that's his meme that I reposted. He's at Live Vite on uh, Instagram. He's a great guy. And um, But I, I love the concept there and the point that he's trying to get across is hey there's a lot of micronutrients that are in meat and this is something i've spoken about as well and something i talk about in my book um, there are tons of micronutrients in meat and organs uh, meat and animal foods because animals are muscle meat and heart and liver and all these things that are really not found in a lot of other places within our diets that are not well represented or not represented at all in plant foods. And so this is a big deal. This is actually a really important thing for people to understand that when you're eating a steak, you're not just getting protein and fat, you're getting unique amino acids like answerine, taurine, uh, carnitine that have incredible roles in the human body that we don't even understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, taurine has been studied in Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, carnitine, acts as an endogenous antioxidant, meaning it moves electrons wow. in the body in the proper way. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's things like creatine, which is this. Uh, let me go back to that just last one you said on carnitine, because I, I don't think people ever really talk about or think about meat as containing antioxidants. That's a really interesting perspective. You know, I think berries and fruits and colors. I don't think meat as a containing antioxidants. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Meat has a, a large antioxidant capacity, and this has actually been studied. I mean, you can look at the antioxidant capacity of meat. Meat also contains glutathione, which is the endogenous yeah. Yeah. quote unquote antioxidant in the human body. That's a three amino acid peptide that we make in the human body that does the majority of the quote unquote uh, sort of policing of electrons in the human body. I mean, I don't think that this concept of oxidation and reduction is well understood. But basically an antioxidant is, is a molecule that is, that is moving electrons around in the human body. And generally we have our own endogenous ones. We don't need exogenous antioxidants. And when we eat quote unquote antioxidants in our food, be it from uh, plants or animal foods, uh, especially from plant foods, a lot of the quote unquote antioxidants from plant foods are actually pro-oxidants. And, and the distinction here is important because an antioxidant is technically a, a compound that's going to accept electrons. In general chemistry, 
101 in college, you'll learn that there's two acronyms, and it's Leo the Lion says GER, which is loss of electrons is oxidation, gain of electrons is reduction. An antioxidant is a molecule that's going to donate electrons to another molecule, and an oxidant is a molecule that's going to strip electrons from a molecule. And so most of these molecules in plants uh, that we think of as antioxidants are actually stripping electrons from endogenous molecules in our body, creating quote unquote free radicals, creating lipid peroxides. And that increase in oxidative stress triggers our own endogenous systems, transcription factors like NRF2, which make genes turn on like glutathione peroxidase, glutathione synthase, et cetera, to make more endogenous antioxidants. The whole thing gets quite complex very quickly, but it's important for people to understand that the human body is equipped with lots of antioxidants endogenously. And glutathione found in meat, the compounds that make up glutathione, the amino acids that make up glutathione are well represented in meat as well, as are the cofactors needed to make glutathione like vitamin B6, pyridoxine. That, that all happens when you eat nutrient-rich foods and your body can make this master antioxidant that can both be oxidized and reduced. So glutathione can move around and it can either donate electrons to a molecule or pull electrons away from a molecule. Generally, it's you know moving around, trying to donate electrons to a molecule that has had electrons stripped from it, and then it's recycled so that the electrons that glutathione donates are given back to glutathione. And this is the molecular policing, so there's not a ton of quote, oxidative stress in the human body. But this is all to talk about your point, which is that meat is antioxidant in many ways, and meat contains antioxidants, and that the nutrients present in meat, whether they're the B vitamins necessary for the enzymatic systems that make our own antioxidants like glutathione or uh, catalase or other superoxide dismutase is another thing. These are all super important for humans um, and they're found primarily in animal foods because you're so right. When we, when we look at um, plant foods and you ask the question, where are B vitamins? It's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, they're not always present there. There are many that are missing. But even beyond that, there are so many unique nutrients in, in meat that, that we talked about in that post. And there's things like creatine, and we talked about carnitine, as we just talked about with the antioxidants. But there's also things like vitamin K2, which is mm. a whole spectrum of molecules called metaquinones. And these generally don't occur in plant foods. There are some metaquinones, specifically MK7, that happens when you ferment some plant foods, but there's no naturally occurring K2 in plant foods. And so these are all super important nutrients that make up things like meat. And then if we go into the realm of organs, there's all kinds of unique nutrients there. And the point is that a lot of these nutrients, the majority of them don't occur in any uh, significant amounts in plant foods, and they're all essential for optimal human health. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Creatine, carnitine, choline, answering, taurine, K2, B12, biotin, folate, riboflavin. And the riboflavin rabbit hole is a fascinating one too, to your point about B vitamins. Ask a vegan or vegetarian where they get their riboflavin, and they will probably be dumbfounded or slack-jawed because there's really not much riboflavin in plant foods at all. You'd be hard-pressed to get the RDA for riboflavin, which many people will need more of, um, mm. especially if you have things like an MTHFR polymorphism, the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase polymorphism. So where do you get riboflavin? Well, you get riboflavin in meat, but you can really get lots of riboflavin when you start eating organs like heart and liver. Those are the super powerhouses of, um, of riboflavin. So that's just the discussion. So it starts with meat when you realize meat is much, much more than just protein and fat, it has all these micronutrients that are essential for really kicking ass in your life. And then the next step is when you realize, oh, and then what about organs? Because people just look at liver. I want to make a meme that's similar to that one from Ryan that says, you know, people have an idea that liver is just a filter. But when you look at liver, it's not a filter at all. And it's full of so many unique nutrients that don't occur even in muscle meat. Yeah, I would say your your liver is a factory. It's not a it's not an organ of elimination and it's not a filter at all. Your kidneys are a filter. I mean, but your liver's not a filter. Your liver does alchemy all day long. It's like totally repackaging and restructuring, recycling molecules plus producing so many things. I mean, what a crazy organ it is. And anyone who hunts knows or butchers animals cuz you take that thing out, it doesn't look like anything else in the animal kingdom. It's, it's magic and it's sacred to so many indigenous cultures. When I was in Tanzania with the Hadza, 
uh, and they would kill an animal, whether it was a baboon or a goat or an eland or a genic cat. Every time that liver came out, they treated that thing like it was made of porcelain. They like gently placed it on a rock and they carefully divided it up among people. I mean, that thing was sacred and they're not going to get a whole lot of liver among 40 or 50 guys, but they know they're not just going to like discard it. They're not just going to give liver to the dogs. They eat a little bit of that liver every time they kill an animal and they treat it like it's so precious because it's so uniquely full of, of nutrients that don't occur even in the muscle meat. I want to I want to come back to your time with the Hadza here in a minute because um, that's obviously really powerful stuff and there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I just want to add this one comment real quick, um, which is, and we talked about this on your show, but the I you know there's this recurring theme here on on our podcast that there's no poisonous lookalike deer. We always joke with about hunting, you know, and and how with plants. Um, you know, obviously the, the idea that plants contain these secondary metabolic toxins, um, which is the whole science of herbalism is, is sort of the allopathic application of plant toxins to, um, impact symptoms. So that's what allopathy is based on. Um, and plants, every plant you eat has sort of, or use in medicine has a different impact based on its unique chemistry and some can really, really harm you. But you start to look at animals and you're, man, none of them are very, very rarely, right? I can think of like, people will go, oh, puffer fish liver. It's like, you're right. There, there are occasionally animals that are toxic, but they're so rare that we kind of have these little memes in our head about it. But typically the meats of animals are not toxic. Animals instead create defenses like claws or teeth or wings or ferociousness of some kind, right? But uh, the ability to sting, those kind of things, whereas plants, which are stationary, produce it in their tissues. And so um, it's interesting that uh, there's this idea that people have, you hear it all the time, and it's there's no, never anything to back it up. Like, it meets toxic. It's like, where are you getting that? Meat's actually less toxic than almost any plant. And I get so frustrated by that kind of like, um, you know, unsupported uh, statements like that. You know, I did a podcast this morning, Daniel, with my buddy Sagar, and we were actually talking about politics uh, and talking about the way that social media is going and the way from that... breaking point you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, no kidding. I love their work. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And he said something that I thought was really insightful, which is I'm paraphrasing him now. The majority of people hold a lot of beliefs that they have never substantiated or examined carefully, mm -hmm. but that they hold because they're just told that over and over and over. And I thought, man, that is a profound statement. How many of us hold beliefs? And I think that in your community, it's a lower number than the average, you know, of the population for sure. And hopefully in mine as well. But I think that as humans, we, we often go through our lives until we take the time to carefully examine different pieces of the beliefs that we hold. And we hold these beliefs just because the majority of people we know have told us these beliefs are true and we've never examined them. And that idea that like meat is toxic for humans or that meat is, is killing the planet or, you know, causing these, cancer is another one you hear. Exactly. Like. Yes. Those beliefs are almost always held by people who don't understand what that belief is based on and haven't actually done the work to look yep. at the science. And I get it. Like not everyone out there is an epidemiologist or a scientist or a physician, but when you're holding a belief like that and you hold it religiously and uh, you don't actually understand what it's based on, that's kind of a scary thing. And that's why I think we both do the work we do trying to tell people like, hey, those beliefs you're holding, you should question them. And you should question them from an evolutionary perspective. You should question them from a scientific perspective. You should question them at a lot of uh, perspectives because we think they're just all out wrong and they're hurting people. And avoiding those foods in your diet, what I consider to be the most nutrient-rich foods on the planet that have all of these unique nutrients is only going to cause more suffering, which is a bummer. Yeah. And, you know, I, I do have compassion because I've certainly held a lot of uh, beliefs that I've since realized to be false over <laughs> my lifetime, especially in the last, the last five, six years have been very illuminating to me. Um, as many ideas that I thought were mine have come to the surface as being, I'd say, Marxist ideas or Leninist ideas that were sort of just part inculcated slowly over time. I thought things that I believe that I now have kind of come to light for me that I'm like, oh, I don't actually believe that, you know. But um, similarly, like where I where I lose a little compassion is like in this. I was one of these people, but it's like, man, I get frustrated by the lack of deductive reasoning. Like 
cancer is a relatively new phenomenon. Meat eating is an extremely ancient phenomenon. So if you can see cancer rise like a hockey stick on an exponential growth curve in recent years, how can it be that it's caused by meat, which we've been eating since we've been a species? This doesn't make any sense. But somehow, like through the magic of cognitive dissonance, we're able to hold these kind of uh, crazy, you know, with without really going like, wait a second, why don't we see, you know, hunter gatherers having all of these cancers? Why don't they have all of these things that are supposedly caused by meat? It's it's just like really funny because, uh, you know, people. I guess people don't under you know most of us don't understand the past, but but that kind of leads me to to your time with the Hadza. I'm I'm really curious what your assessment of that was and what you learned. And are you familiar with the book about the microbiome? I think it's called Rewild. Um, and it's about a guy who went to spend some time with the Hadza and, and having his, you know, feces checked for his microbiome and everything. And he arrives at such radically different, um, conclusions than you do from your time with those people. And, uh, so I'm just curious if, if you're familiar with that and if you can comment on that and just like to hear about your experience, uh, going to be with those folks. Yeah. You make a great point that the Hadza, the Ikung, um, the hunter gatherer cultures that, are gone now that were studied a hundred years ago. These people generally, I mean, like not, not even generally, like consistently did not suffer chronic disease. Uh, they did not have heart attacks at the rate that we do. They did not have diabetes. They did not have obesity. Uh, they do not have cancers. I mean, it's just the whole thing is why I was so fascinated by ethnography and anthropology and wanted to go visit the Hadza. And the reason I went was because they are some of the last remaining hunter gatherers on the planet. And when you really look into that, um, there's only a few groups left and you can really count it on like one hand, maybe the Akung in Botswana, Namibia, definitely probably about a thousand, like literally a thousand individuals or less in Tanzania that are Hadzabe, uh, that are still living as true hunter gatherers, maybe some isolated groups of Kaibimeno Waorani in the Amazon, but that's not much. I mean, that's all I could find. Like if you really look at people who are living as hunter gatherers today in 2021, there's not many. And so I thought, wow. This living is very... their traditional life way as hunter gatherers. Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. There's just not much of it left. Um, yeah. I mean, there's neo hunter gatherers, I, you know, like you, but um, yeah. just... <laughs> I, I, I shudder to call myself that. Like, you know, that's obviously marketing, like modern hunter gatherer. But I always, whenever I say that, there's like that little bit of shame where it's like, I don't mean to imply that I have the um, ecological knowledge or interconnectedness of the peoples we refer to as hunter gatherers. I just hunt and I gather. So <laughs> what else am I going to call it? But but, you know, I certainly don't put myself in that category. Um, and the, you're right, because there's like so many people groups where there are still language speakers and they're still represented as um, as a people, but they are removed from their traditional life way and have gotten onto Western foods and Western medicine and Western lifestyle. Uh, can we go back to one point real quick? I, I just before you tell us about your time there, I just want to offer, I guess, like in fairness for the listener who's, you know, when we say things like they don't have those modern diseases, which they we typically don't, um, certainly they do deal with, you know, infection, injury, parasite, you know, load, thing like, so there, there are things that, that we have been able to get past with modern hygiene and our modern lifestyle. Uh, but what we've ended up with is all these really awful diseases that, uh, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, that we were kind of not present there. Would you say that's fair? We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first, have you ever thought about your light diet? We think about the food we eat and the water we drink, but what about the light we consume each day and especially at night? It's important because our light diet or the light we consume through our eyes is like a kind of electromagnetic nutrition, and it influences our circadian rhythm and hormone production. Our bodies need that crisp blue light of the early day to set our circadian rhythm. That's our body's internal clock, and that's why it's so good to head outside first thing in the morning to jumpstart your day. But our computers, tablets, phones, home lighting, and vehicle headlight LEDs also use blue light that tricks our bodies into thinking that night is day, upsetting our melatonin production, disrupting our sleep, and even impacting our all-important mitochondrial function. That's where raw optics comes in. Raw Optics produces the finest blue light blocking glasses to filter out the unhealthy or rather untimely light from our devices, helping to optimize our light diet and restoring our circadian rhythm. 
Unlike the rest of the industry, raw optics are the only blue light blocking glasses that use melanin pigment infused lenses, not an external coating that can be rubbed off. They're streamlined and stylish and they have daytime and nighttime designs. If you work on a computer, spend a lot of time on your phone or drive at night where bright blue LED headlights are shining into your eyes, you need to check out Raw Optics. Go to rawoptics.com, that's R-A-Optics.com for 15% off your order. Again, it's spelled R-A-Optics and you'll get 15% off by using the coupon code WILDFED. Now, back to the show. I would say that's a very um, astute and, and correct characterization. And this is, it's very difficult to make the comparison apples to apples. Yeah. Um, but, but I think it's important to try. And by that, I mean, when you look at hunter gatherer cultures, people um, will often say without understanding the basis of the statement that their life expectancy is much lower than ours. Therefore, who says they're living in a quote, healthy way. But one of the things that comes along with being a, quote, free living human is a much higher infant mortality for all of the reasons that you enumerated, whether it's postpartum infections, postpartum bleeding, getting bitten by a snake, falling over when you're two years old and, you know, tragically injuring yourself in a creek bed. Uh, life is Average dangerous. life expectancy. Average. In other words, if yes. we factor in anyone dying between zero and 15, sure brings that average way down, doesn't it? It does. And if you look at their, quote, life expectancy after they reach adulthood, it's equivalent to ours. Yeah. And then if you go one step further and you look at their, quote, health span, their health expectancy, you see that they dwarf us. And that's wow. the important thing that you can look at what's called squaring of the morbidity curve. And, you know, mortality is death, but morbidity is life with disease. Right. Morbidity is a word that we use in medicine. It's like, how, how decrepit are you? And if you look at the measurement of decrepitude of these hunter-gatherers, they, they are essentially free from decrepitude in any way that we would define it up until the last few weeks of their life. Yeah, they, have, they have so much higher vitality, so much higher flexibility, uh, muscle mass continuation, like the ability to live their life. You see 70-year-old guys out there hunting. And when I was in Tanzania, which I'll tell you about, you know, they were guys who are probably late 50s, early 60s out there hunting with us, climbing trees, 30, 30 feet up in the tree in a second. Like these are the elder statesmen and they're not, they're not limited in their vitality in any way, shape or form. So this is what's really cool about this. But people miss that. They just want to say they lived a short amount of time because their life expectancy is low. Well, and, you know, and one of the things we know about mammals in general is when you put them in a zoo, they live longer. About 80 percent of mammals live longer in the zoo. Uh, the question I always ask people is like, do you think the lion would rather have a slightly shorter lifespan um, due to being rough and tumble and being free or living inside of a cage? You know, like I'll certainly take freedom over a cage regardless of life expectancy. You know, I mean, that's to me one of the strange things like, yes, we have where we're, everything is padded here. Um, we are protected from a lot of the pitfalls of being in a wild environment. But as a result, we have far more mental illness and less satisfaction with our lives. And because we've forgotten the way that we're supposed to eat as humans, we have far more chronic illness as well. Yeah. And so the analogy goes, I think is, is well suited here. Most of us live in some form of a zoo of our own construction, willingly or not willingly. I mean, you and I both spend time in houses. We're not living in the wild all the time. So there is some sort of construct here. And it's not all bad, but when you put the lion in the zoo, I mean, there's a great adage about this that I think um, I heard about on the Weston A. Price website, which is that lions are a great example in the zoo. Like maybe in the 1950s or 1960s, when they were moving some lions that were endangered into the zoo, they, they realized they were feeding the lions just muscle meat because that's what lions eat, right? They just eat meat. That's, that's you know, meat is everything. Uh, for lions and, and they realized they weren't reproducing at the normal rates they just weren't i guess the lions didn't have libido you know there was no there was no sexy music playing the lions weren't weren't horny and what's going on and then they realized of course we're not feeding the lions their species appropriate diet and then they give the lions liver and heart and they actually take whole animals and they give the lions whole animals and what happens everything gets back yeah. the mojo comes back all the nutrients are there so that's just to say that I believe that as a species, homo sapiens or lions or canines or cats, whatever species we're talking about, it's important to ask the question, what do we understand? What do we feel is a species appropriate diet for this 
this yeah. species. And that doesn't really change a lot over time. It doesn't change quickly. That can change, <laughs> right. but right. not not in the realm of like a thousand years, right? Without massive selective pressures. And so we have to think about humans. And this has always been sort of my fascination. Like, is there a species appropriate diet for humans? Can we take, uh, can we take information? Can we take indications from the way that our hunter gatherer ancestors have eaten for hundreds of thousands, millions of years as homo habilis and homo erectus? And, and I believe we can. And, and that's, what we see in this work and what's interesting for me about people returning to that sort of way of living. So the, the lion analogy is fantastic. Um, you know, I will, I will gladly live in a house for the fact that rain doesn't follow me while I'm sleeping, but I really want to understand what a species appropriate diet is. And mm-hmm. I want to understand other things that I may need as a species, as a member of the homo sapien species, I probably need sunlight on my skin. Uh, I'm not really going to listen to mainstream dermatology recommendations that I should just take a vitamin D pill because what if there's something else valuable from the ultraviolet light or the full spectrum of light in my eyes, in my retina, in my suprachiasmatic nucleus, on my skin, making things like nitric oxide? I digress. But there are so many things about being a human that are important to consider that are species appropriate uh, that I think that we have forsaken. And so that was another intention going to visit the Hobbs. I wanted to see how they ate. I wanted to see how they lived. I wanted to see what their health was firsthand. I wanted to see how happy they were. I wanted to see how they slept. I wanted to ask them all the questions because I fear, Daniel, that in two to three generations, they, they may be gone and, or that they're, because certainly their land is being encroached upon. And that was something that I learned while I was there as well. So I'm happy to talk more about whatever aspect of that you're interested in. Oh, well, I'd like to ask one question and then I'd love to get what your takeaways were and what you saw in particular, um, watching a people who are on the edge of, I guess, like sort of the extinction of their life way, um, maybe not as a genetic group, but as, as a life way. But one, one question I have, um, kind of just starting off is how they, how they perceive meat, how they feel about the animals that they hunt, like how, like how important is meat to them? Um, because again, we've got all these folks who are thinking maybe meat causes cancer. Maybe we should be getting away from meat. Certainly as we see the, the world, uh, health organization and, and other groups sort of releasing their diet, Harvard's recent dietary sort of guidelines, you know, you see this movement away from meat and, uh, I'd love to hear how this group perceives meat, how important it is, is it to them? You can ask, if you ask them this question, in fact, you can phrase it a different way and not even lead them. And we did this in Tanzania when I was there. You can ask them, what is the most important thing in your life? <laughs> Me. Me. That's, <laughs> that literally, that's what they answer time and time again. Oh, I love okay. It. Let's rephrase the question. What makes the best day of, what would be the best day of your life? They say, the best day of my life would be when I... Uh, go hunting with my tribe and we kill the biggest animal and bring it back to the tribe and we all sing and dance and we celebrate and we eat until we're completely full. That's the best day of your life. Hmm. What do you, what do you dream about? We dream about hunting and meat. (laughs) What's your favorite (laughs) food? Meat and honey. Uh, Like, (laughs) I mean, it's very clear where meat stands for them. It's, it's nearly a deity, uh, you know, and it's not, there's nothing, you know, godlike about it. It's just they understand uh, that animals are simply hunting animals, eating animal foods is simply the biggest determinant in how they live their life. And and they do gather plants, and we can talk about what I observed and how that may be different than what other people have observed, and, and the way that I interpreted that or other people's uh, interpretations. But if you ask them, and there's actual studies that have been done by people who have spent way more time with them than I did. You know, what are your favorite foods? They consistently rate uh, meat very high up. They actually will usually rate honey as their favorite food. But when I was there, they, they clearly preferred meat even over honey. And so meat is the center of their life. And by meat, I mean, not just muscle meat, as we talked about earlier in this podcast, I mean, meat and organs, but there's yeah. so much there's less organs, but they do not discard the organs. They eat everything. And by everything, I mean, everything except for the guts with poop in it. They generally give that to the dogs who have to get something. They have dogs. They don't really keep the dogs as pets. They keep the dogs as help for hunting. And so the dogs get the intestines. The dogs generally get the large intestine and the small intestine. And uh, when I saw them, they would often take the stomach and eat the stomach themselves. But uh, 
that was the part of anatomy that the dogs got. But I ate baboon brain with them. Wow. Uh, you know, we would eat the, the, the ears, the cheeks. Uh, they eat everything. They eat How many animals. animals do they eat? And does it range? Do they practice entomophagy, for instance, what I call micro game hunting? Do they eat insects? Do they do they have any fishes? Do they have reptiles, amphibians or you know, birds, like what, how, how broad is the, uh, menagerie that they eat from? So they definitely eat birds. Um, did not see them eat insects. I know there are a few, uh, anthropology texts about the Hadza that we could refer to, but I have not seen that documented, uh, in, in great detail. There may be a few times of the year when there are massive insect blooms. I wouldn't be surprised if they do eat insects, but I didn't see it in, in mass when I was there. They weren't eating like the larva of bee or bees or they did. They like definitely that. do that. They definitely okay. and I did okay. that. I mean, yep. yeah, they just didn't when they were eating the honey. It's all uh, in so there. It's all in there, and we ate the yep. whole comb with larva, and that was. I love that idea that you're getting the protein along with the you know all that fructose and glucose. It's cool to me that there's you know traditionally. I mean, because you know, I you know, I was looking on your uh, again on your social media, and you sort of ha- you had a few posts about like sort of the uh, intense energy burst that you get from liver, which is pretty you know experiential. Uh, but similarly, when I eat like uh, royal jelly or you know like the queen bee larva stuff like that, and I get I get pretty zoomy off of that. Absolutely, and, and man, they go crazy for honey, and I had some of the best honey. If not the best honey I've ever had in my life with the hods on two yeah. or three occasions. I mean, so the, there was one time when we went on a, on a baboon hunt with them and they got a baboon, they killed a baboon. And that people are sort of squeamish about that, but look, this is life and death for them. And the reason they're hunting baboons is because their lands are encroached upon by pastoralists, Totoga and Maasai, who are sort of disregarding um, governmental Tanzania asks and regulations that the Hadza have pristine hunting lands. You can't hunt in something that's not a wilderness, if somebody's grazing a cow and goats in a field, like there's not going to be wild animals there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not completely destructive to the ecosystem, but it's definitely changing the ecosystem. And that that is very hard for the Hadza. In order for them to hunt big game, which they are hunting less and less of because of this encroachment of their lands, they need large tracts of land to do this. That's just the nature of wilderness and ecosystems. And so they hunt baboons. And again, we ate everything. We ate the hands and and every piece of that baboon. And the first thing we did was burn the hair off and eat the the organs. And we did that before the baboon even went back to camp. I was eating baboon liver and baboon heart and baboon kidney. It's like the hunter's portion, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they were just like, there was no point in bringing the organs back to camp. And, And the organs, honestly, are going to spoil more quickly. So they do it within the first maybe 20, 30 minutes that the animal's been killed. It's on the fire. And they're eating the organs and we're eating the whole animal. I ate baboon brain the next day, like I said. And so there's all of that, but they do hunt birds. I saw them shoot birds with arrows. These are wooden arrows that they make uh, out of with their wooden bows. And they were shooting birds in trees at like 20 to 30 yards. It was pretty incredible. Um, And so they did eat birds. They ate small monkeys uh, that we, while we were hunting, they eat larger game like eland with poisonous arrows from, a plant called an elephant foot that I, I made the poison with them one day. Eland is a, like an antelope. Uh, yeah, it's like a large impala. It's like yep. a, a thousand kilogram impala. Yeah. Okay. Like so, the size of an elk, but yes. but instead of a cervid with antlers, it has horns. Exactly. Uh, yes. And th- that's the, the, their favorite thing, and, and their favorite foods are the biggest game. You ask them, well, "What's your favorite?" It's eland, and the yeah. biggest food they can hunt are, are yeah. the foods want them most of but is it harder but it's harder for them to acquire that versus i mean i imagine a lot of the smaller animals are out of necessity as well as variety yeah yeah and they'll take what they can get we had genet cats while we were there oh wow yeah so you're you're eating cats and primates over (laughs) over there like all the taboo stuff in our culture paul i want to break in with a question here um i'll we'll come back to the hadza here in a second but on based on your um your research. Now, if we were talking about plant foods, and again, you know, full disclosure, I'm a plant eater too. Um, when I think about plant foods, I think about variety. And I think about avoiding eating too much of any one thing because of the bioaccumulation of the particular secondary metabolites or those plant toxins that are in there. Um, you know, I, I think variety is really important. 
But when it comes to meats, do you, have you ever seen any research or is there any, do you have an opinion even, is it important to eat a variety of meats or do you think when it comes to meat, that's less important? Like if I only ate chicken and chicken livers and chicken skin and chicken hearts or beef and the, all its organs, like does that matter the way it does with plants or the way it does with fungi or something like that? Or do you see it as like, you know, no, it doesn't matter. Eat all beef all day. You're fine. Well, I think that getting variety in your food is a good thing in general, both for enjoyment and uh, you know, make, to make it interesting. As we talked about earlier, there are no secondary metabolites in animal meat or organs that we're aware of that serve as defense chemicals. Uh, so I think that, that that part of the equation is less concerning. And the reason that we're thinking about eating plants differently or the reason that I think about plant parts like stems, leaves, roots, and seeds on a spectrum of toxicity in relation to fruit is that there, I look at the amount of the secondary metabolites and sort of the intention of plants. And there's a little bit of anthropomorphization in there, admittedly, but I'm trying to think like the plant doesn't want this part to get eaten. It definitely especially doesn't want the seed to get eaten or at least shoot up. So there's all these plant metabolites in there to dissuade that. But as we talked about, that doesn't really happen with animals. I think that most humans today would be just fine eating beef all the time. I don't think you want to just eat the muscle meat. I think you want to eat the organs right, right. for all the reasons we enumerated earlier, the unique nutrients in the organs, the unique peptides, which we didn't even really talk about in the organs that don't exist in the muscle meat. Muscle meat is super valuable, but it doesn't have a ton of riboflavin, doesn't have a ton of folate, doesn't have a ton of biotin. Right. Also all that connective tissue too, though. It's really easy oh, yeah. to say muscle meat, but like there's also, you know, all of the, um, all of the cartilaginous stuff, all of the gelatinous stuff, so that, you know, it's getting that good um, balance of muscle meat and of connective tissue, I think is really important as well as the organs. So I think, yeah, when you're eating the organs and you're eating the chewy bits of steaks, it's you're getting the collagen, and that's important as well. I mean, there's collagenous fibers in steaks, but we're so conditioned as Westerners to want things like tenderloins and medallions that are really just muscle. <laughs> There's no connective, there's smaller amounts of connective tissue. There's not tendons. There's not really grizzly bits, but those are all super important. And sure. you'll get more of that with the organs as well. So there's My so friend important. Arthur talks about the balance between glycine and methionine and, uh, uh -huh. and that there's some evidence that that too much methionine from, you know, excessive muscle meat without the balance of the glycine from, from the connective tissues can be, uh, is potentially been implicated in some cancers. I don't know how true that is, but that's what he's, he's talked about here on the show. And I always, I always think about that. Like, cause I, you know, I love eating loins and tenderloins and all those nice steaks out of the hams, but I also love cooking a deer neck or, you know, uh, a shank too, and getting all of that nice slimy sort of gelatinous stuff too. I think you're right. If you look at the amount of glycine versus methionine, in steaks versus collagenous tissues, it's very different. I mean, there's 23, 26% glycine in collagenous tissue because collagen is, an, is another peptide that is made of, you know, a third, almost a third glycine. Whereas muscle meat is much less glycine. Interestingly, the amount of methionine in muscle meat is actually less than the amount of glycine in muscle meat. So it's not totally clear in human physiology. I don't think we really understand what the absolute ratio of methionine to glycine we need is, but I think that like I said, these guys, the Hadza, our ancestors, are eating tendons off the bone. They're breaking yeah. bones to get the bone marrow. They're eating collagenous organs uh, that are chewy. They're, they're not shying away from this. They love it. And there are ways to circumvent this. I think that that's one of the reasons I do what I do with my company, Hard and Soil. There's a lot of people who don't want to eat organs or who don't want to eat chewy bits of steaks. And so, you know, there are ways to desiccate pre sure. and capsules. Yeah. I, I, you know, my hope is that that makes it easier for people to at least tiptoe back to certainly the lowers the barrier to entry. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, that actually makes, I have one more question before we get back to the Hadza and that's, um, what, one of the things that I lament as a hunter, like if I go to the supermarket or go to the butcher and I look at what's on the shelf, most of that meat's fresh. In other words, it hasn't been frozen. Uh, whereas most of the meat that I eat, except for right after a kill, you know, like all day today and all day yesterday, I'm eating fresh bluefin tuna. My buddy just caught a beautiful bluefin and I'm eating this fresh meat and my goodness, does it feel good? Um, you just eating it raw. 
But when I want to cook, you know, the deer that I shot last fall, it's been in deep freeze. Um, Have you ever seen anything or do you have any opinions on the difference between eating fresh versus preserved, frozen, dried, etc. meats? Is there any evidence one way or the other? Do you think that that's less of a, is that less of a concern for you? You know, I haven't gone down the rabbit hole too much because logistically it would be so hard (laughs) to eat frozen meat, right? Yeah, of course. You're absolutely right. The hods don't eat frozen meat. When they have a big kill like in Eland, they will make jerky just by drying it. So they, sure. they do some preservation. Okay. Of meat. And it's not like the Inuit aren't eating frozen, you know, people of the northern exactly. latitudes are going to be eat frozen meat. So, I mean, I know there's precedent for it, but but we tend to, in our cult, it, as hunters, at least in, in North America, we tend to eat so much of that because, you know, or, or anybody who goes and buys a side of a cow or a whole cow or something like that, it's like you end up eating a lot of frozen meat. And, and you, there is a, you know, it's like being a connoisseur of wines or something. There's definitely like a, you know, if you're a meat connoisseur, you can tell the difference when you eat something fresh, it's just that much more savory and that much better. So I've always wondered about that, but, but haven't really heard one thing or one way or the other from anybody before. I mean, definitely, you know, obviously you encourage your listeners to get out and hunt and definitely eat deer that's not been frozen. If you can hunt it, it's, you know, that's, that's the way to do it. But I think for most of us, we're going to yeah. eat some frozen meat. Yeah. What, and I'm what were you like, really bad about it? Back to the Hadza, what were what did you experience around plants there? Um, you know, I'm I'm curious how you saw that. Uh, you know, I was looking at a post you made about um, suggesting that their fiber intake is lower than people might assume, and I was curious about that because being somebody who forages, you know, I end up eating a lot of fiber and and like the effect of my body. Um, but I, I know you have a different opinion and I want to give you some space to talk about that. Yeah. So the, the danger here is that I didn't live with him for a full year. Um, right. Yep. And, the, and their year has certainly got to be built around a whole circuit that they do, I'd assume, right? Like a, a, a right. Right. things come into season. Mm-hmm. But the assertion in the popular media is that all year round, they're eating massive amounts of fiber. And, and I just... I found that to be different than when I was there. So the two weeks that I was with them, and I spent every day with them, right, Uh, all day. We can't sleep in the camp with them, uh, per the mandate of the Tanzanian government, but we spent eight to 10 hours a day, and we asked them about their food repeatedly. They just weren't seeking out plant foods in the same way they were seeking out animal foods. And they certainly didn't have a lot of fiber in their diet. Uh, the, The main confusion, I believe, or I fear, is that with the tubers, Many of the tubers are eaten raw, or even if they're cooked, the the quid is spit out. And so I fear that, I mean, when people are quoting numbers like 150 grams of fiber per day, I'm just thinking there is no way that for those days that I was with them, they got even a fraction of that. A lot of days, I didn't see them eat any fiber. I just saw them eat honey and liver and meat. And I thought, okay, where's the fiber? And we asked them one day, I went with the women and we dug tubers. I think we dug equa and, and I ate the tuber and you, you don't eat the tuber. You basically chew it and then you spit out, mm-hmm. All that fiber. It, which is the yeah. majority of the insoluble fiber. There might've been a little bit of soluble fiber in what I chewed, but it wasn't a whole lot. And then you're eating berries there. The berries aren't that high in fiber. And I was like, where's the fiber? And if you look at the literature on the Hadza, they sometimes will take the seeds of the baobab and grind them into a paste. That's going to have a ton of fiber. But they didn't do that when I was there. They weren't like, women weren't like making baobab, you know, seed stuff. And I thought, why do they, you know, my sense is that they're doing those things as a backup. They're like, those are really low down on their list of quality foods because there are published studies by Frank Marlowe and other Hadza scholars that if you ask them, like I said, what are their favorite foods? They enumerate five things consistently. And those things are Honey, meat, berries, baobab, and tubers. Well, you know, there's no baobab seeds on that list. And by baobab, they mean the baobab fruit. There's no pumpkin leaves or they don't, like, you know, they're not saying, like, the leaf of this plant is our favorite food. Like, those are, in my observation, which is, of course, not perfect, like, those are really low-down fallback foods that they'll use. Again, they're not always as successful as they need to be with their hunting. And one of the crazy things about being homo sapiens is we are omnivorous. I think there's a lot of evidence that we are an animal-based and animal-leaning omnivore. And if you look at the work of many 
uh, in the zoologic space, there is a good amount of evidence to support the fact that the majority of omnivores lean either toward herbivory or animal consumption. Well, it's not a terribly controversial statement. Like more than 70% of species considered to be omnivorous either have an animal focus or an herbivorous focus. And so that to me is interesting. And I thought, well, I think as homo sapiens, we're pretty animal focused. Like we're going to, if we can get more animal foods, that's what we will eat. And this has been observed across multiple cultures that the amount of animal food consumption is proportional to the amount of availability, <laughs> that the more successful their hunts are, the more animals they eat. And the same thing is true with the Ikung. And I want to go visit them, Botswana and Namibia were closed when I was in Africa. But you read books by scholars on the Ikung and they'll say the, that exact line, that, that when kills are successful, they eat large amounts of meat, up to yeah. two kilograms a day per person, which is <laughs> wow. more than four. Yeah, and these are not huge people, right? The Hadza are generally... Haven't they you know, seen the new guidelines? That's way too right. much. It's probably right. going to cause cancer. Uh, yeah, it's clearly... Then why are they not, that's more than four pounds of meat and organs per day. These people yeah. are eating. Like, what? It's crazy. So... Um, that, that is what I observed. And, and I observed them spitting out the quid and then the, the, the berries that we ate had a seed and they would spit the seed out. They didn't eat the seed. Okay. Uh, they didn't like chew the seed, they spit the seed out and they were spitting the quid from the tubers out. And I thought, I don't really think they're getting 150 grams of fiber all day every year. Maybe there's a time at some time of the year when they don't have a lot of food and they're gonna eat a bunch of pumpkin leaves or maybe they're gonna make a paste out of the baobab seed rather than the fruit. but. They're, they're certainly not, I did not see evidence to corroborate the notion that they're eating massive amounts of fiber per day. Yet that is the assertion of many armchair uh, anthropologists who yeah. have, or, or many, I shouldn't even say anthropologists, armchair scientists who have not visited the Hadza, but are parroting what they see in the research um, and, and say, well, that's the reason that their guts are so healthy because they're eating 150 grams of fiber. And that's the reason I take issue with this because in my significant research into fiber and its relation to the human gut, I've kind of come to the conclusion, which is counter to the mainstream, that it's it's kind of a wash. That for some people, you can eat a bunch of fiber, but a lot of people don't need a lot of fiber to have a, quote, healthy gut. If we measure a healthy gut in terms of alpha diversity or other, you know, uh, epithelial barrier integrity, like fiber doesn't do any of those things for humans. Fiber makes your poop big. And helps you win a pooping contest. You, you don't but, think that it it provides substrate for um, organisms in our intestinal tract? Not substrate that you can't get other places. So this is a really important distinction to make that short chain fatty acids are like butyrate can be made from fiber, but they can also be made from protein and they can oh, be made from collagen. Yeah, yeah. And there's actual studies that have been done with this. They can compare plant-based and completely carnivorous zero fiber diets and, and short chain fatty acids are still made with zero fiber in the diet. And Interesting. you make butyrate, you make isobutyrate, you make acetate, you make propionate. All of these can serve the same role in the human gut, which is really manifold. But the, the main ones that people talk about are the fuel for colonic enterocytes, which use the butyrate to make beta hydroxybutyrate and then use that for metabolism. But you can also use isobutyrate for that or other short chain fatty acids. And they have um, signaling functions. But Lo and behold, isobutyrate, which is made from protein uh, and collagen, collagen being a protein, signals the butyrate pathway in the gut at the receptors in the same way the butyrate does. People get very butyrate myopic in the gut and they say, if you don't have fiber, you don't have butyrate. Well, that's bullshit, first of all. And second of all, there's lots of other compounds that can serve that role. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to completely cut out fiber in their diet, but the other side of the equation that's often ignored by these pundits is there's a whole lot of people who do better from in, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel illness, when they cut out fiber from their diet. There's mm -hmm. a study about this that I talk about all the time. This is such a valuable study. It was published in the, um, I believe it's the World Journal of Gastroenterology from 2012. I'm just recalling that from memory. And the title is Stopping or Reducing Fiber uh, Basically Eliminates Idiopathic Constipation. I'm paraphrasing the title, but we can find it for your listeners. Um, and the study was 60 or so people divided into three groups. One of the three groups did fiber as usual. One of the three groups reduced their fiber. And one of the three groups of about 20 people ate zero fiber. And all of the people in the study had idiopathic constipation, which means... In other words, idiopathic, like they, we don't know what causes it. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know what's causing your constipation. And um, 
the group that had zero fiber completely resolved their constipation. Wow. Completely resolved. 100 counterintuitive. People, yeah, resolved gas, bloating, pain, etc. So, and because constipation is so widely misunderstood in the health space, I think it's important for people to understand that constipation is not just about stool caliber. Uh, constipation is <laughs> pain with passing stools, right? It's bleeding, it's use of laxatives. Um, because if you look in the medical literature, there's really not good evidence that fiber improves constipation. Fiber will give you bigger poops, but it doesn't really help with other symptoms of constipation like pain, bleeding with passing stool, use of laxatives, discomfort, gas, bloating. Fiber doesn't fix those things. Fiber will give you bigger poops, but it doesn't fix constipation. That's really not a controversial statement if you understand the gastroenterology literature around this, this food, um, around this substance. And so there are many people who can eat fiber and don't have an issue, but for those people, and this is actually true of a lot of the work I do, I think it's for people who are suffering who don't have other answers. It's like, wait, the mainstream is telling you, eat more plants, eat more plants, eat more plants, eat less animal foods. Don't you dare look at red meat and eat more fiber. That's the reason you're suffering is because you're not eating enough fiber. And I would say, wait a minute, hold on. Like if you are really suffering, understand number one, as a human, you do not need fiber to have a healthy gut. Number two, you can completely eliminate fiber as an experiment and see how your gut does and then reintroduce certain types of foods, maybe fruit or honey that are lower in insoluble fibers and difficult to digest starchy fibers or whatever and see how you do. And none of that is going to destroy your gut. None of that is going to lead to quote unquote leaky gut. None of that is going to kill your colonic epithelial sites by starving them of butyrate or any of that stuff. So I want people to be empowered and understand that there's so much more out there in terms of these alternative hypotheses. What about were, were you seeing the use of plants as medicines, as stimulants, as psychoactives um, to treat infection, to, tr you know, topically or internally for, you know, as anthelminthics or for parasites and things like that? Absolutely. And that's an important distinction to make um, and one that I've made in, in my work or tried to at least communicate to people with the work that I do that um, I think that there's pretty good evidence from these hunter-gatherer tribes and anthropology that there's a difference between using plants as medicine and using plants as sustenance foods. And the, the latter is, you know, a plant forming the majority of the diet or a significant amount of calories and often sought out. And the former is, hey, so-and-so's got a stomach ache. We're going to go dig up a root to give them as medicine. And I definitely saw that latter situation repeatedly. I mean, while I was in... Uh, Tanzania, both uh, one of my traveling companions, Anthony Gustin and I, but Anthony first developed like a diarrheal illness that potentially was related to too, eating too many of the hods of berries. We're not quite sure what caused it. And as you know, Anthony got sick first and he was at camp and he was like, oh, my son doesn't feel good. And they're like, oh, come with us, Bawa. It's like the word for friend or the word for man. Um, and, and they dig up this root and, it, and he tries it. And of course I'm standing there. I want to try it. It tastes like shit. But they were like, here it is. And, you know, they don't know what's going on in his gut, but they probably know from experience that sometimes when people have guts that hurt, they have a parasite. And so who knows? That's probably an active compound in that root that is either an anti-helminthic or an anti-parasitic or something. And so, yes, absolutely plants as medicine. But a lot of the work that I've done has been saying, let's just question the notion that plants are the best food for humans and that we should. And I can get concerned when people start eating plants at the expense or the exclusion of more nutrient-rich meat and organs that we talked about. Right. Yeah, absolutely the reason for that. I didn't see them use plants as hallucinogenics. They didn't, the Hadza don't seem to have a strong culture around that sort of thing uh, now. And we actually saw, I believe I saw some psilocybin mushrooms there because there are places where cows graze and there's, you know, psilocybin mushroom grown out of, out of shit. And so I asked them through a translator, like, do you guys eat that? And they said, we do eat mushrooms, but not those. While I was there, they didn't gather or eat any mushrooms, um, but they didn't they didn't eat that that mushroom that I suspected was psychedelic. Psilocybin, yeah. <clears throat> yeah well, well yeah. zooming forward to kind of uh, today and and over here in the U.S., I, I'm curious about. Well, I guess you're down in Costa Rica, but watching what's happening in the U.S. with modern health guidelines. I, I want to just get your feedback on that, and in particular, I really appreciated uh, one meme you had on your social media was. Uh, 
it was like a little quiz one two three like here's these different ingredient decks which one's dog food which one's impossible burger which one's beyond burger and uh, it was there to illustrate that you know from an ingredient perspective they look really similar and then you kind of scroll over one and you've got this picture of you know actual ground beef and it says ingredients beef and then you got the impossible burger and uh the beyond burger and you show those ingredient decks people are being convinced that this stuff is equivalent and uh, i want to just see you know i want to give you some space to talk about you know these this trend we're seeing not just towards getting meat out of the diet but the replacement of meat with these you know sort of synthesized meats and then um where you see all this headed because when i look at it i'm like oh it's factory farming people that's what we're doing (laughs) it's like it's like why you feed grain to a cow it's like because you're going to raise a lot of them and you're not going to put them on pasture you're going to raise them under the you know, conditions to get them to prime condition for market value. And so I sometimes look at the human population. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're just raising people for like taxation and labor. What's the cheapest thing we can feed them, you know, like to get maximum extraction of resources out of them. But but it certainly doesn't seem to be about building strong, healthy people. Um, that doesn't seem to be the concern. So when you see this stuff, like what do you what, what's going through your head and what are you thinking about these these meat alternatives and things like that? It's super scary shit, man. Um, and I think that this is so relevant to what we talked about with the other meme with, you know, meat and beef and people see beef as macronutrients. And if you see food as macronutrients, you can create a synthetic food that has semi-equivalent macronutrients, but it misses the whole point. It's not going to have the micronutrients. You can't just create slop with equivalent macronutrients. So if you see animal foods as purely macronutrients, Yeah, you can make a Beyond Burger with eight grams of protein, but is it the same quality protein? Is it the same nitrogen uh, utilization? Does it have taurine in it? No. Does it have choline? No. Does it have creatine? No. Does it have K2? No. So it's just, this is the problem is if you are, if you are persuaded or propagandized to the point that you see animal foods and food in general as macronutrients, then you can be led down a Pied Piper rabbit hole. And I think that this is where many of the plant-based advocates want to take the conversation because, I mean, even when James Wilkes was on Joe Rogan, he was, they were arguing about protein in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I was like, this is complete bullshit, man. Like, <laughs> that's the problem is why are we arguing about that? Like, let's talk about all the other- You could just eat problems. peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I didn't see that episode. I don't even know who that is, but that's hilarious to me. Yeah, and they, you know, he was it's like, oh my God, like, What's the, you know, what is the, the utilization of the protein? Is it the same quality? What about all these amino acids that it's missing? What about all these other micronutrients that it's missing to be healthy humans? And I think there are so many fallacies in the plant-based vegan movement of these. Uh, they, they put forward these bodybuilders who are clearly taking massive amounts of synthetic protein that have distilled amino acids that are concentrated, that are like nothing you would ever find in nature. And they're probably taking steroids and other growth hormones. And they're saying, look at how, quote, healthy or vigorous or muscular you can be as a vegan. But... I mean, their, their vitamin stacks, as we talked about earlier, must be just a cornucopia of unique nutrients that are deficient on their diets. And so I do think you're right that this is, I think it's driven by profit. There's, there are not many, there are no farmers who do regenerative agriculture of cows or, or lamb or sheep or bison who drive Ferraris that I know. There's, <laughs> there's, there's nobody getting rich on that. There are no billionaire uh, regenerative farmers, but you bet there are billionaire and multimillionaire people who invest and build processed food companies. And yes. so if you can create a movement where people think that animal foods are hard or bad for you or bad for the environment, and you can trick them into thinking that they can make macronutrient equivalent plant foods that are processed, then you can shift trillions of dollars, if not trillions, and billions of food dollars toward processed food with a much higher margin. So that's, that's the goal, in my opinion. And not all of it is nefarious, but I think that many people play into this narrative. They're not, they're not trying to sell you kale. They're trying to sell you processed Beyond Burgers. There's no, there's, I don't think there's, to be fair, I don't think there's a lot of kale farmers that are billionaires either. Right. I don't think there's any <laughs> that are billionaires, right? Yeah. And I, I don't think kale is a great food for humans because it's a leaf and it's defended and all the things we talked about earlier, secondary plant metabolites. But there's just not a whole lot of, of transparency here. And I fear that a lot of the benefits for 
these processed plant foods are to the investors, not to humans that are eating them. And well, okay, you're being, you're being very you're you're being very diplomatic in this. I was, I'm almost a little surprised because I'm I've been noting the intense censorship you've been experiencing uh, in social media, and I appreciate you documenting it. And sometimes I look at this stuff, and it seems that the same voices that are promoting that are censoring. Uh, are the same voices that are promoting a very one-sided political agenda, are promoting a very one-sided socioeconomic agenda, are promoting the dietary agenda. I'm seeing it all kind of like coming from one direction. Do you know, you, would you concur with that? Do you see what I'm saying? Like when I look at like who's involved in this stuff, it's like the same people are involved in all these different aspects, whether they're their media, whether they're social media, whether they're dietary, medical, pharmaceutical. It seems like all of these things are linked together and, they, and you can always trace them back to the same characters. Um, just, you know, I'll just leave that hanging and see what you have to say about it. No, I agree with you. It's, it's difficult to tease out, but... Like I said, I had a podcast with Sagar this morning from Breaking Points, and I don't think it's controversial, no matter what side of politics you, you, you land on, to, to make the statement that um, liberal media used to be about freedom of speech, uh, the ACLU, and, mm -hmm. and suddenly, I think, with the Trump administration, um, there has been a real backlash, and there is a lot of push uh, within circles that lean left to censor people. And, and I think it's a response to Trump and Trump did a lot of really shitty things. And man, the guy probably lied a whole lot. Um, but but it, it does seem like there's been an overcorrection in the media. And so I think there's a lot of people in these interest groups that have vested financial interests that lean left and that don't like cows and don't like meat and don't like the environment to be influenced by these animals and, and are not willing to have open discussions about that and don't want anyone to be talking about it. And that is really tragic in my opinion. And I, I see that association. And that's not a declaration of my political views. That's just an observation. Um, and, and we should point out that, uh, you know, Sagar's co-host on Breaking Points is Crystal, who is a progressive someone left-leaning person and Sagar kind of leans right. And so, and I don't think about politics as much as I think about medicine and human health, but I think that anytime any political party uh, overly politicizes science, we're, we're in a deep, uh, we're in a deep, deep cauldron of shit uh, <laughs> because suddenly you can't talk about things. And that's what bothers me the most now is that you can't talk about COVID vaccinations and bring up any questions. You can't talk about climate change whether you want to talk about regenerative agriculture or just question the underlying science, you can't talk about gender politics. You just can't even have conversations. You can't even watch a video about it without being, without there being like a, a um, disclaimer underneath the video trying to persuade you to look at one other side, but it never persuades you to look at the other side. It's very fascinating how this works. Today, I was, um, I was thinking about, you know, it doesn't come up too much anymore, but are you familiar with the event 201 that happened just before the, the COVID um, outbreak? Where, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you got you got Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation involved in that, right? Where they're wargaming a coronavirus that comes from bats like and causes a worldwide pandemic. And what, just months before the outbreak, right? They're wargaming that. But it was the World Economic Forum was part of that as well. And they're the same ones behind the Great Reset promoting this idea, you know, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And all this stuff is tied into climate change and is tied into this like movement of vegetarianism and, you know, getting the population off of red meats and all this stuff. So it's like it's all kind of mm, sticky how it's all woven together, you know, and it's interesting today that uh, that what we call liberalism has censorship in it. I mean, I grew up with. I grew up with like, as a liberal growing up, like it was the conservatives wanted to always, they were always like censoring everybody, you know, or like my wife and I were laughing the other day because she's a teacher and she works from home now privately. And I was like, Hey, you remember growing up, it was homeschooling was this thing that like the, the hippies did, the leftists did. And now they're all about like <laughs> the school system and it's all these like cons so-called conservatives. They're not, you know, none of them fit at the classic conservative or liberal models anymore. Obviously all this stuff's in flux, but it's funny that it's the more 
so-called conservative people who are homeschooling now. They're like, don't want their kids in the school system. It's just funny. Everything's kind of switching now, right? Like what we used to call liberalism isn't liberal anymore. What we used to call conservatism isn't conservative anymore. I mean, everything's sort of, I, I really think we're in this like fourth turning event, you know, that uh, Neil Howe talks about in his book. But but it is strange to watch and watching people like you get censored for just trying to have common, just trying to ask questions or, or talk about things. I mean, it's really mind boggling. Yeah. And there's the whole conversation now about ivermectin and Pierre Corey and Brett Weinstein, and you know, that getting censored. And <clears throat> it's a crazy thing when there's a dirt cheap drug that has a lot of safety data and nobody can talk about it. And you're like, mm-hmm. what? Yeah. What? What? Oh, because it might threaten the profit margin of Merck and other companies that have other drugs in the pipeline for COVID. That's probably what's going on. But you can't say that. And I don't think anybody was even saying that. They were just saying, hey, ivermectin could be helpful. And there's people all over the world using it. And whoa, that door got shut real freaking fast. And I got censored on Instagram uh, for a live that I did in which somebody asked me, would you get a COVID vaccination? And I said, I've had COVID. Uh, I'm a metabolically healthy individual, which I can prove based on laboratory work that I do on myself every six months. I can check my fasting insulin. I can check my fasting glucose. I've worn continuous glucose monitors. Like I am a metabolically healthy, not inflamed individual whose immune system works. And I've had COVID. And there was a recent study from Nature showing that when you've had COVID, you have durable immunity for six to 11 months, potentially longer. Against many aspects of the virus versus against one minor aspect of the spike protein on the virus. Yes, precisely. And so why, why would I get it? Why would I get a vaccination? <laughs> like, I, I'm not aware of any reason to get a vaccination um, with mRNA that, that hasn't been done a whole lot in human history. In fact, it's never really been done. It's not a approved. Truly, truly a experimental long, yeah, technology. Yeah, that we don't have long-term data for. Unapproved. Still vaccinated. unapproved. Still unapproved technology. Rush to market. Um, yes. I mean, this is a really unprecedented moment where you would you would expect the entire world's population to take an experimental drug. S- given the, the history, like I brought up thalidomide earlier as a great example, where it's like, imagine if they had gotten the whole world to take th- thalidomide experimentally and then been like, let's just see what happens in a couple years. <laughs> you know, like, it's not like this is a vaccine like we've seen before. I mean, it's definitely something radically new. And, and, you know, the the mRNA is encapsulated in lipid lipid nanoparticles that appear to concentrate, at least in murine, you know, rat and mouse models in the ovaries. Well, that's kind of scary. And bones. (laughs) And bone marrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is that a problem? Like, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying, like, all of those things give me pause. Mm -hmm. And, And, you know, I'm thankful that I had COVID and had a mild case of it. And I know there are many people who haven't had mild cases and have suffered greatly. And it's not, I've never come out and said that I don't think the vaccine will help some people. I just thought, hey, you know, this is something we should Me- be able medical to free- Medical freedom and, and choice yeah. seem important to me. And yeah. it is interesting that a lot of the voices who, who are so vehement about it are the same people that, you know, 15 months ago were anti-pharmaceutical companies. You know, they were, and now they're calling themselves Team Pfizer or Team Merck or whatever. And you're like, really? Because I remember not that long ago when you were so against all these pharmaceutical companies. And now it's like they are they're on the team with them. It's really strange, you know, and especially when you look at some of the lawsuits that these companies are dealing with because of things they've done in the past. Did they suddenly become squeaky clean? This makes no sense. But, you know, we're living in this like emperor wears no clothes moment where very little makes sense, you know. I mean, I this is why I hunt and gather, dude. I, I do it, you know, I love the food piece is important to me, but it's just the sanity of having something to come back to that I know doesn't change every, you know, week to week to week to week. It's like the same thing humans have been doing for, you know, 300,000 years. It's like, cool, sign me up for that because I know that that's stable. You know, and you think about the way that humans communicated when we were hunter gatherers for the last. 500,000 years of Homo sapiens evolution, the last two to four million years of Homo hominid evolution. There, were, there, were, there was nothing in between. We're playing this horrible game of telephone now with social media and all of what we're being told is filtered and who owns the news media outlets. Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. The chairman of Reuters is on the board of Pfizer. Um, BlackRock's heavily involved in a lot of these. <laughs> we're yes. going to be finding out and, more and more. And we sound like conspiracy theorists now, but we're just saying things that are completely fucking true. Uh, and, and, and I want to go back to the point that I made at the beginning, which was that 
the majority of people hold beliefs that they have never deeply examined and they don't even know why they hold these beliefs. Mm -hmm. So when, when the majority of our opinions are formed based on consensus and the majority of information that we're getting from outlets that are tainted, be it about meat, organs, climate change, vaccines, gender politics, whatever, like what the heck, like yeah. what is actually true? And you think back to hunting and gathering in the way that you live with the Hadza or the way that the Hadza live, like there's nothing like that, right? They're saying, Hey man, you're in my tribe. Let's go hunt in Eland. I'm going to make a poison arrow. Let's hang out by the fire. Like I'm going to share some meat with you. You're going to share some meat with me. You know, your kid is over there. I'm going to keep my eye on your kid. You're going to keep my eye on, you know, you're going to keep your eye on my kid. And, and, and that's how it's going to be, you know? And, and it's, it's just such a freer form of communication without all of this, uh, rhetoric and confusion and that, that's a crazy it's just a did they crazy did they have any sense of what's going on out here like uh, you know what's going on politically what's going on you know for instance the idea of vegans do they understand do they know about that and like do you ever talk to them about any of these kind of things that were you know any of the kind of like real like obviously insane things that we're talking about culturally and entertaining right now well they don't know about politics they did know about covid because they asked the tour operators, why, why are there less tourists coming to see us? And, you know, when you first think about the Hadza and you think about the fact that tour operators are bringing Westerners like myself to the Hadza, many people say, well, you're tainting them. But I just want to make the very important point that the reason that they're protected and the reason their lands are protected is because the Tanzanian government has realized that people will go to see them. If people were not going to see them, and they were not yep. able to yep. show the way they live to people yep. from all over the world, mm -hmm. they would probably be gone. The Tanzanian government, I do not think, would have valued them enough and they would be mm -hmm. gone. So it, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a dicey proposition, right? It's like Schrodinger's cat. Like if you're you know, you, you can't look at an electron without changing the, the velocity and the trajectory of an electron. Um, but the Hadza are certainly being influenced by us visiting them, but it's also resulting in them being more uh, robust and being able to preserve their lands. But having said that, they had a song about COVID and they were praying for people that COVID would go away because they wanted more people to come see them because right. that is one of the ways that they get money. Again, they're not completely preserved, right? And they use money to buy cornmeal and sometimes they use money to buy alcohol and marijuana. So. They're an incredible time machine, but of course they're being affected by Westernization. And so they know about COVID. They might know about Trump. I don't think they knew about Trump. I don't think they know about much beyond that. They don't know much about what's going on in the world today. It, you know, and it's it's one of those interesting things because they it, there's this tendency. I have a I have a friend, Sam Thayer. He's he's one of the more influential, um, if not the most influential forager in the United States, and he. Uh, has been sharing some stuff, ideas with me. He has about the origins of anthropology as actually, you know, being um, uh, apologetics for racism and that early anthropology in particular was very tainted by this. And we've gotten to this point where we, some of us like want these peoples to be preserved at the expense of their own agency. Like they can't decide they want access to the outside world or outsiders or outside money or outside food. Like the idea that we would be like, no, you have to stay in your pristine bubble because we didn't and we want you to. It's like, well, they can make their own choices too, you know, and we have to let them have agency, uh, you know, to it, that. That's always this like really interesting thing to me that, you know, we lament that they don't want to stay in the state that we didn't stay in. Right. It's very yeah. interesting, all the politics around how that works. And and obviously they have uh, they are modern people and have a modern right to be involved in the world, however they see fit, whether we like it or not, whether I personally wish they would stay hunting and gathering and, you know, versus, you know, smoking weed and eating corn. Like, I, you know, I don't have any say in that. That's their that's up to them. <laughs> that's their choice. You know, there is a bit stuff. of good news here, though, which is that we ask them. This question, we say, hey, you see the Datoga over there with their cows and their goats, and you see the Maasai. Like, why don't you live like that? You can go to Arusha or you can go to Karatu, which is a town in Tanzania near Lake Iasi where this group lives. Why don't you do that? And they say, oh, no, we like the life we live. Hmm. Uh, we want to eat meat. <laughs> we want to hunt. We don't want to live that life. They could easily walk out of their camp. They know what the heck is out there. They're choosing to live this life yeah. because they 
they're prescient in a way. They're, you know, they understand like the fact that their life is pretty good, that their quality of life is good, that they're happy, that they, they get to spend time every day doing fun things with their friends. And <laughs> they don't have to do, they don't have to mm-hmm. work on a job they don't like. They get right. to see sunsets and sunrises and they get to sit around the fire and play music. And yes, they become westernized and we introduce tobacco and marijuana and cornmeal. But they also get to spend a lot of time with their family and they get to spend time with their friends hunting. I mean, we went hunting with them one day for nine hours. They just cruised around, man. They just had a good time. That's they were awesome. shooting birds and trees and then, you know, celebrating the, the capture of a baboon. They looked like they were having fun and then they go to sleep and yeah, they spend time with their kids and they make bows and arrows and they, they could easily walk out of that camp and go live a life like ours. But they've decided, no, we don't want that. And we don't want to live like the Totogo. We don't want to be pastoralists. We don't want to have herds of animals that we have to watch over and just walk around. That's boring. We want to go hunt. (laughs) Yeah, man. That's how I feel too. (laughs) But uh, so so tell me what's uh, what's on the horizon for you, man? How are you? How are you dealing with all this stuff that's coming in? What's your plan? What's your where? Where's things headed for you? You know, and then tell people sort of. where they follow your work and, and all those kind of things too, how they support you. I'm who knows where it's all headed right now. Uh, I spend most of my time in Costa Rica because it's, uh, I live by the ocean. I surf every day. I want to do the things that I think are fun. And there's a concept that I've talked about in my social media called the remembering, just this idea of trying to remember where we've come from as humans the things we need to be happy as humans. And I need, sunlight, I need ocean, I need play, and I like being in the jungle. And so I live on the Guanacaste Peninsula in Costa Rica the majority of the time now. I'm in Austin occasionally, and I'm really excited about just doing things like this and sharing ideas with people and just getting things out there that might help people through my podcast and other podcasts. And, you know, I've got a lot of fun podcasts in the works. I will just say that I have a lot of concerns about the mainstream ideology around climate change and that being used to promote agendas that are counter to the things that I believe you and I both believe in. Um, I'd like, second, I'd second what you're saying there. I see that all happening too. And it's like this thing you just can't talk about. You immediately get called a climate change denier and it's like, Hey, Whoa, <laughs> not saying that climate's not changing. I'm right. saying, I don't really agree with this agenda that's being pushed, uh, supposedly as a salve for that. Yeah. You know, I think it was after the last podcast we did on my podcast, um, which is called fundamental health. Uh, that we talked a little about cryptocurrency and gold and and hard money. And I'll just say that, you know, Chinese government regimes are using the excuse of climate to ban Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin and decentralized currencies and cryptocurrencies and hard money is a topic for another conversation. But I think this is a super important conversation for lifting lifting people out of poverty and allowing uh, a lot of the 7.8 billion people or however many people are on the planet to lead better lives and to be free from the tyranny of central banks and uh, inflation and inflationary currencies and government tyranny and uh, militaristic rule. And yet governments like China are saying, no, no, we don't want to be Bitcoin money in our country because of climate change. So, and then, you know, uh, the most nutritious foods on the planet are being threatened because of arguments around climate change. And so I I think in the future of my podcast, I'm just going to go down the rabbit hole very very deeply and that's what's on the horizon for me. I really want to give people the ideas uh, around this and just offer both sides of the equation. Like what do we know about anthropogenic climate change? It's quite fascinating. And and I think that those are the important issues for me um, to be discussing now are, you know, what are the things that we assume are true that may not actually be true that we should be questioning. And this is something that's been a fascinating rabbit hole for me on all of my journeys. And I began with diet and nutrition and meat and organs. And um, I think that it's going to keep expanding into many other things, whether it's sunlight causing cancer. Oh, really? Like maybe we should figure out all these <laughs> When did that start? Food. That's so interesting. It seems like humans have lived under the sun. Let's see Forever. the whole time. When did yeah. this sudden cancer causing issue arise? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you gotta say that there are not some people who... And just to, to, to clarify that position for people so they don't get confused, uh, we don't have time for a full discussion, but 
you know, my, my position there is, oh, you mean if we eat crappy food and our cell membranes are full of evolutionarily inconsistent levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids like linoleic acid, perhaps being in the sun, could lead to increased levels of sun-exposed cancers like squamous and basal? Yeah, that's possible. But is that really the chicken or is that the egg? And Well, globalization too, I think like, you know, if, if you're a, a European, you know, from Ireland and then your people are shipped to Australia where you don't have time to adapt to that level of sunlight, or if you're from sub-Saharan Africa and you end up here in Maine, uh, you probably are going to have a hard time getting enough vitamin D unless you yeah. really, really prioritize sun exposure. So, you know, I think globalization plays a bit of part in that too. You know, so, you know I wouldn't want to be like a nearly clear-skinned person suddenly in an equatorial area <laughs> without some kind of adaptation. But, but yeah, this thing amuses me a lot. Yeah, but there's, you know, what's interesting is I, here in um, Costa Rica, I'm at the ninth latitude and I had a friend here who was from England and, you know, he was pretty white, but he was able to develop a solar callus. You know, he was out in the morning and yep, evening yep. and man, that guy was dark. Yep. So I believe that, that humans are pretty adaptable and we can make, we can make melanin in our skin. It just takes a little time, but yeah. So anyway, there's so many of those rabbit holes that I think are worth talking about. And that's, that's, what's valuable to me these days. And um, and I'm super passionate about helping people get more animal foods in their life, especially organs. And I mentioned my company, Heart and Soil. We make desiccated organ supplements from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle raised regeneratively in New Zealand. And if people are listening to this and they're getting fresh organs, that's fantastic. But I would encourage you to check out what we do at heartandsoil.co if you're interested in getting the unique nutrients in organ foods and eating like your ancestors, but you don't want liver and kidney and spleen and pancreas um, testicles too. I love that. I love yeah, that. Pro- I love Thanks for the products there. you sent out. By the way, that that one you call the whole package. Yeah, <laughs> it's very amusing to me. I like that a lot. We just released the testicles containing supplement, and that's super exciting. And um, yeah, I don't know. At least subjectively, when I eat testicle, I definitely think it helps with libido and. It, why wouldn't there be peptides and testicles that are important for my own testicles? And even women benefit from that supplement. Um, so I just think it's important for people to eat like our ancestors, to get more meat, to get more organs, to not fear these things, to understand that there are unique micronutrients, that we can't just distill everything into macronutrients. And so that's the work I want to do and try and be as creative and eloquent as I can with it moving forward. Um, but I think the best place for people to find me is at heartandsoil.co. I host my podcast there and my blog. And people can always reach out to the team there. And we go to great efforts to uh, answer questions, even if people don't uh, want the supplements that we make. We help people with infographics and information about how to eat more animal-based. Well, man, I love it. I really see you as an ally, and I really appreciate the work you're doing. And I'll say that I think you and I probably on the same page on a lot of things that I don't talk about publicly because I've just... I've made the decision to, uh, not get, not wade into some of those waters, but, um, you know, sometimes it's hard not to. And so I just appreciate what you're doing and putting yourself out there and taking those risks and, and being willing to, uh, deal with the censorship and all those kind of things. And, uh, I just re- I really respect what you're doing. And, um, I just want to put it out there. If you're ever on the East coast and you make your way to Maine, I want to cook bear for you so bad, you know, I want to like slather everything in bear fat <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and cook some of these uh, different, you know, I got all these amazing game meats I'd love to share sometimes. So if you're ever out this way, either. please let me know. Yeah, I can't wait. I hope to, and I appreciate the stuff you're doing. And it's good to have allies, you know, it's even though we are uh, thousands of miles away, I do think we're, we're from the same tribe and we're, we're about the same things and that, that feels good. So thank you for the work that you do. And I similarly hope that you'll make your way down to Costa Rica and we can go out on a boat. Yeah, or spear fish or just do some diving. Yeah, exactly. A surf or something. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed, food is all around you.